Welcome to Redefiners, a podcast designed for daring leaders who are changing what it means to lead in today's increasingly complex world. I'm Nanas Motoshami, a leadership advisor at Russell Reynolds Associates. And I'm Clark Murphy, Chief Executive Officer. Nanas and I have spent our careers exploring what works and what's next in the realm of leadership. In each episode, we ask our guests deep and provocative questions about how they've challenged the norms and how they've redefined their organizations and ultimately themselves as leaders. Also, you can answer this one question. How are you redefining your leadership? Perhaps the boldest question yet. Conversations that matter. Inspiration for us all, whether you're kicking off your career or crafting your legacy. Thanks for joining us. Let's dive in. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Redefiners. Today, we're talking to a leader who is working to redefine healthcare in the U.S. Clark, as you know, I spend all my time working with a variety of healthcare clients, and I can't tell you the number of conversations I've had where clients are really talking about how they can and should be using data and analytics to disrupt the current treatment paradigm, to provide better care, to accelerate their R&D pathway, to basically improve things. And in my mind, in my experience, very few have actually been as successful as the gentleman that we're about to meet. So I am very excited to hear how he's done it. Tell our listeners who our guest is today. Well, I'm pretty excited as well. I've got to say that we talk about disruption in so many other businesses and to see the disruption in healthcare and what uh, Mario and Oscar's doing. I'm not in the healthcare world, so I'm pretty pumped to hear this discussion as well. Uh, To our listeners, our guest today is Mario Schlosser, who is the CEO and co-founder of Oscar Health, whose mission is making a healthier life accessible and affordable for all. Oscar is now the third largest for-profit national insurer in the individual market in the U.S. based on membership. The company has been recognized as one of Fast Company's most innovative companies in health, one of CNBC's top 50 disruptors, and one of Time's most influential companies in healthcare. So this is going to be a great day. Mario, thank you very much for joining us on Redefiners. Welcome. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me on the program. Mario, we'd like to start by talking a little bit about you because you have had a somewhat circuitous route to where you are today and a very interesting background. You studied in Germany. You were then a visiting scholar in Stanford and you co-authored one of the most cited computer science um, papers that's published in the last decade. Um, you've worked on the investment side, you've been a consultant with McKinsey, and then you went to Latin America to set up the one of the biggest uh, social gaming companies. All of that, I'm guessing, before you were 40 um, and before you started yeah. <laughs> Oscar Health. Tell us a little bit about yep. the early years, the influences and in your journey to uh, where you are today. Yeah, you know, I would say that the uh, um, common threads throughout all of this is the creative use of data. Uh, it's kind of the creativity of what you can do with data insights and then getting those data insights and, and some quantitative insights into what's going on that have always uh, excited me. Um, at McKinsey, I was, I think, the only person on the team who knew how, how to use array formulas in Excel. Still a great way to shine at McKinsey, by the way, you know, simple trick. But uh, if you know it, then you can get some insights others can't get. And, um, you know, at uh, Bridgewater, the global macro hedge funds, um, I was sitting there looking at economic data, trying to make sense of what will drive inflation, what will drive growth, and turning that into actionable insights for trading the, the global financial markets. And finally, in the, in the gaming company, my co-founder Josh at Oscar and I started, um, the, um, you know, first of all, I always loved games. So that was a good motivation. But the reason why I love that is because in these types of games we were building there, online games, social games, these they generated a lot of data insights in real time. And so they let us study in a, in a pretty deep way how you can use financial incentives and some, you know, different ways of representing something on the screen and so on to really influence how people act and influence how people, how people kind of go about, uh, in this case, playing an online game. And so I thought that the when when Oscar started, um, that the biggest, obviously most thorniest problem I think uh, in the U.S. economy is the cost and the complexity of healthcare. The U.S. spends more than any other country in the world on on healthcare. It's 80, roughly 18 percent of GDP at this point. I think the next highest country is Switzerland at 11 percent GDP. 
It's got some of the worst outcomes um, among the rich country. So that was the thinking behind Oscar. Data-driven generator of incentives to get people on the right path in their own healthcare journey and keep them on there. So hold on one sec, though. So we're in Latin America in the gaming business, which is people's free time. And then we bridge to healthcare in America, which is critical time. Mm -hmm. We're going to go from passing time to saving time in lives. How did you make the transition? Couldn't be two more different businesses. Yeah, it, it really couldn't. So at the end of my time at the gaming company, we had caught one of these classical downwinds in gaming. Gaming is a very cyclical business, right? If you kind of miss one generation, whatever, of games, you're going to be on the down low for a while, uh, on the out for a while. And so as a founder of that company, uh, I got fired from, from my own company, essentially, um, found myself back in New York. Um, the company was mostly in Buenos Aires at the time. Uh, my wife was pregnant in the third month. Oh. She was a postdoc at Columbia University doing research in, in neuroscience. And, and so, um, you know, it wasn't a fun situation to be in, really. But in that situation, the first coffee my co-founder, Josh, and I had, um, he said, you know what? Uh, let's do something real and serious and impactful uh, for once, not, not build, just build mm. games or another consumer internet app, whatever else, right? Everything, the stuff that people usually chase after, oftentimes in Silicon Valley or even uh, its New York equivalents. Uh, and so insurance was really about as far removed from this as it gets. And, and um, he came with a rough idea that insurance is generally a market where you really haven't had any startups and you definitely haven't had any technology startups that was sort of like the motivation for looking at the space. And then as it happens, again, we were going through pregnancy, my wife and I. And so we had this real world example for how much will this cost us by the time this is over? And so who's going to be the best OBGYN in New York to go to and, uh, and all that stuff. And, and we didn't think that in any way the insurance company was visible or helpful at all in that process. Mm -hmm. And so purely from, from me trying to get to know how the healthcare system works, I thought a lot of data must be running through it. A lot of insights, therefore, must be kind of embedded and hidden in it. And I'd want to kind of tackle and, and unearth that, you know. So that's where that came from. So before we get to Oscar, though, that's a defining moment. You're, you're an entrepreneur. You get fired by, by your own company. Um, that's, that's more than a downwind in gaming. That's a downwind sometimes for you. Uh, the family's getting started. How did, did you second guess doing another startup? Did you, what was this moment of, of definition for you of doing another entrepreneurial venture? Yeah, I mean, I second guessed it, I think, probably uh, I, uh, dozens of times in my life. I, 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 let me almost start with another story there. I remember very distinctly, I was at McKinsey in 2004. It's about two years out of my Stanford visiting researchership. Um, still had many friends in Silicon Valley. Uh, the Valley kind of started coming back again a little bit in 2004, 2005, coming out of the first bubble having burst right in the beginning of the 2000s. And so I told McKinsey, I'm going to take a summer off and I want to go um, back there for a couple of months and start a company again. I didn't tell him that, but I told him I want to take a summer off. Uh, and so I um, met up with a bunch of my f uh, friends from there who had still at Stanford and professors and, and, and still PhD students and, and started programming, basically. And, and we went in an apartment in San Francisco and didn't want to buy a bed because I didn't know how long I was going to be there. <laughs> I slept on the floor in a sleeping bag, all the classical stuff, you know, startup stuff, basically. And so um, my friends at McKinsey, they, that, who were on the previous team I was on before I went took the summer off, all had projects all over the world. They were working long hours, but they were also in great environments and had a good time uh, and everything and were learning a lot. And I was miserable trying to like write codes in, in, um, without a bed, basically, in, in an apartment in San Francisco. Uh, and I remember at the end of that summer calling my McKinsey friends and saying, I, this is a great A-B test for me. I now know I never want to start a company again. Uh, and obviously, you know, this is 2004, so you know, it didn't quite live up to that promise. But it was similar in the beginning of 2012 when I had gotten fired from Vos2, the gaming company. Um, I definitely thought, well, you know, I'm not sure what it is for me, uh, starting something. And so, um, I thought a lot of it was my fault as well. Uh, there was a lot of sort of like a classical first-generation startup mistakes we made, um, again, in missing paradigm shifts in the strategy, but also a lot of personnel stuff. We were fighting between the co-founders and then fighting between other co-founders, you know, all the classical stuff. They're all friends of mine today, so that's a good thing. 
But uh, it was all avoidable, I think. We mm. were in a good position, avoidable, and that kind of weighed particularly heavily on us. And so, so I basically said, said to myself, I give myself until the end of the year. I promised my wife the same. I said until the end of the year, I had saved a little bit of money, um, will hopefully be fine. She still had an income at the time. She was still in university. Um, and so we can just kind of go for a while and then see what happens. And then fortunately by October, Oscar was in full bloom, not full bloom, but it was, there was something there, you know, that mm. we could nurture and therefore go in mm. and do that. Harry, I also love your story about getting the data yourself for your own personal experience when, when your wife was pregnant. I, I have my own story to set, to share. Um, I had difficulty getting pregnant. I have one son. I had difficulty getting pregnant and I, I live in the UK. So we have the national health uh, system, which is great, but queues are very long. So tried to go through the NHS to get pregnant, took forever, went sort of privately, saw a number of doctors. None of them I felt really understood and had the experience I wanted. Yeah. The ones that the healthcare insurance, uh, my healthcare insurance company was, was uh, recommending. And so it, fortuitously enough, at the time I was a strategy consultant and I was consulting to a large pharmaceutical company that happened to have a big business in women's health. Yeah. And so they mm. knew all the best OBGYNs. And sure enough, they were kind enough to give me some data on the leading OBGYNs in the UK. And hey, presto, literally within the space of three months, I was pregnant. Excellent. Um, Great so, use of so data. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I understand how you and I individually can use that data yeah. if we're lucky enough to get it. How does Oscar use data on a national level to improve some of the things, some of the issues that you mentioned earlier in terms of cost, in terms of complexity? Yeah. How have you improved things? One quick anecdote, very similar to yours, when, with, when my second child came, it was before Oscar was a football insurance company. We started one, one 2014 to actually insure people. So we were still building it, but we already had data about physicians in New York City. It's a lot of claims data, basically. And so I calculated it and printed out for me in a cheat sheet the C-section rates of the physicians we might see that night when we, when we went in, in the hospital, just so I would know if somebody comes to me and has a particularly high C-section rate. You would avoid that. I would know to not be, uh, exactly, like <laughs> maybe uh, at least argue, you know. And so, yeah, it's, uh, that, that data exists and, and it's, um, it is just underutilized, I think, in a lot of ways. So a number of different ways in which we're using it today. One is... Um, in helping you make better kind of planning decisions uh, as a member of Oscar. And that, for example, includes that we have a measure of provider quality, provider total cost of care efficiency, um, and, and provider satisfaction, meaning a member is satisfied with when they go to a provider. And we, we rank all physicians constantly by these three different metrics. Um, and that means that for a particular primary care physician or women's health physician, we can give you a bit of a better insight as to who to go and see, including for a particular issue. And we know when members of OSCA have been to a particular physician, what they look like, who they are, what issue they saw the physician for, and we can then tailor the recommendations we give you more towards that. So the activity I think we do best at OSCA is, is generating member engagements Mm -hmm. and getting people really excited about using Oscar as a starting point to navigate the healthcare system. But again, the insurers have these insights, or should have these insights, and, and therefore that's a, if you can generate the member engagements, that's a powerful gap to bridge. There's almost no correlation between the quality of physician and the cost of a physician, in the US healthcare system at least. Um, because there isn't any mechanism to put those two things in line, right? You don't really know as a patient what a physician costs, and you don't really know how good he or she is. And so we know those things. We can bias you there towards the top quadrant, high quality and high efficiency, meaning low costs. So the real time happenings in the healthcare system are extremely important for us to get at and help you out um, when we can do that properly and well. And I'd love that example because it makes you, I imagine, much more human as an insurance company than most other providers, correct? And I, and I, I remember reading somewhere that in the early days of COVID, Oscar Health called many customers simply just to ask how people were. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we have a, I remember this is, a, is an older statistic now, but um, only 55% or so of, of people in the U.S. had heard from the insurance company, of those who were insured, about COVID. 
we looked at it at the time uh, as to what our number was. And I think we had communicated with everybody at least four or five times. So um, exactly right. It's, uh, having build, it's often a little bit ironic because building that human link yeah. um, can be done with the help of technology. You know, technology doesn't replace the human interaction in healthcare, um, but it can just make it easier and, and happen more often. And that will end up feeling more human and more natural to you as a, as a patient than, than not. We'll be right back with Mario, but first a word from Noel Augustin, a managing director with Russell Reynolds Associates in Boston. Against the backdrop of enormous transformation, disruption, and growth for health tech companies, the role of the chief medical officer continues to evolve. Today, CMOs can play critical roles in everything from product development to sales and oversight for clinical teams and partnerships. To be successful, leaders and boards must think about the growth arc of their company and align the CMO responsibilities accordingly. So how do you hire for this critical role? First, you must get clear on exactly what you need your CMO to accomplish. What does success look like and how will this leader contribute to your overall strategy? We uncovered six distinct CMO archetypes to help clients hire the right leader. Those archetypes are a sales enabler, an internal aligner and people manager, an external connector, a scientific leader, a regulatory and policy expert, and a product builder. Once you're clear on what you want your CMO to do, it's essential to create the right onboarding roadmap. For CMOs to thrive, there must be alignment across the organization, board, and even key external stakeholders. Clinical leaders will continue to be a key part of the healthcare industry's growth. Defining the specific needs that your CMO must meet will be critical to your success and your ability to leverage their skill sets to create alignment with the growth curve of the company. To learn more about the evolving role of today's CMO and how to foster their success, go to russellreynolds.com slash insights. Thanks, Noelle. And now back to our conversation with Mario. I love the business model. I find it fascinating. How do you, where do most of your customers come from? Is it sort of dissatisfied customers that switch over? Is it new to insurance customers? What, how are you winning people over? How have you become the third largest? The majority of business is still in the Affordable Care Act market, which okay. by definition is a lower income market. These are people who didn't have insurance from their employer, which in the U.S. is the vast majority of people who are not insured through the governments, right? Um, and so it ends up being a lot of folks, you know, within... 200% of the federal poverty line, which in the U.S. is something like, you know, $22,000 a year or so in annual income for an individual. Um, that's where the bulk of membership really sits. And I like that a lot because too often, I think, in healthcare, in the Silicon Valley approach to healthcare, you sort of like start at the top. And that really isn't where the cost is coming from in U.S. healthcare. It's coming from folks being uninsured or underinsured, ending up in the ER, driving costs up without knowing it and, and without doing anything, being able to do anything about it. And we're getting at a population, I think, that really needs needs more help there and where we can provide it in a good way. You know, I would also say a little bit that um, from a purely a business point of view, it shows how, how almost how, how little we knew about healthcare in 2012 because it is the toughest market to be in the individual markets. Um, but I also think in it, it is because it is that it is the most future-proof market in U.S. healthcare. It is individualized, as the name says. Um, it means uh, people without the influence of the employer or whatever, can make a choice for themselves as to which insurer they like the most. And, and I think in a few years from now, we're not going to talk anymore about which insurer is the right one, but it's going to be much more of a blend of um, providers, you know, your favorite doctor who can sell you sort of like his or her insurance directly, um, or your favorite hospital, um, you know, or local physician group. That'll be much more, I think, the relationship you have as opposed to you know, somebody whose name is on an ID card and you don't even know when they are going to be important in your life. You know, the irony of you talking about technology making healthcare more human, if you think about that for a second, uh, yeah. amazing what you're doing. But at the same time, as you said, this is the toughest market in 2012. Consumers didn't intuitively trust insurers when it came to healthcare. Clearly, the demands of consumers are changing um, as it relates to anything happening in consumers, as, as we call it, consumerization of products and goods and services. For our listeners, the term consumerization is taking processes, products and services, and making it more appealing to consumers in how they use it or demand it or look at it. What's the consumerization 
of healthcare as it relates to the payer and the provider? I think the pandemic in particular has put a huge amount of acceleration on uh, the consumerization of healthcare. Uh, that's been a buzzword for many years. Um, insurers love talking about that. Providers like talking about it, which is sort of ironic because providers should be in the most consumerized business to begin with, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, it is a, a you are taking care of, of patients that is consumerized it doesn't end up feeling that way for many patients because providers often don't have great technology tools and great processes to have a more longitudinal relationship with you. You know, and your, uh, your dentist will probably send you a happy birthday message. Oh. Um, your primary care physician might not, you know, and the reason is that uh, dentistry is already a more consumerized business because a lot of people already kind of pay out of pocket for it, you know? So put more pressure in some sense on dentists to build more of a um, consumer engagement engine, if you will, than has usually been the case for cardiologists and primary care physicians and, 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 and the kind of broader healthcare system. The big issue in healthcare still is that um, most people cannot make their own choice as to who they want to want to go with and stay with. Um, my favorite statistic that we, that we recently calculated based on a paper uh, I saw come uh, from, a, uh, from a medical journal is that um, given how even modest physical activity reduces your costs in old age and your cost to the healthcare system in old age, um, from the age of something like 43 years on or so, uh, insurers in theory could pay you $6 per hour of physical activity, wow. which is not bad. Wow. The problem is there isn't right now anybody that can reliably retain a member or a patient between the age of 43 and, you know, 80, because it's not how U.S. healthcare works. When you change your employer, you change your insurance company, and it's all randomized and all that stuff. And so this individualization, I think if that really were to happen, it would unleash another huge shift towards digitization, good consumer experience in the way you just talked about, Clark. Hmm. Maria, can we take a step back and talk about kind of healthcare in an even broader sense? We see an awful lot of disruption and transformation um, in healthcare. You're a perfect example of what's happening on the insurance side. Um, but actually, when you look at some of the big healthcare giants, whether it's the pharma companies or the meta companies, they're reinventing themselves. Take the example of Philips. You know, they started the journey five years ago of becoming a much more health focused company. And today, they have more of their revenues come from their digital services and solutions than their kind of capital equipment um, products. Given that you, you know, are in a privileged position, you have an eagle-eyed view of the healthcare ecosystem, right? You work with the providers, you see the physicians, you have access to the patients, you have some access to, to you know, the pharma and the med tech companies. What's sort of your view of how healthcare is redefining itself or how healthcare should redefine itself? I think broadly there's um, three big trends we see, we, I see in the system and mm -hmm. I think uh, they're going to continue to persist. One is, um, again, as we talk about individualization, right? yeah. the shift towards, uh, you know, you picking an experience and you sticking with it. The second one is shift towards digitization as I talked about and as you gave a couple of examples from Philips as well. And the third one, this is the critical one now, um, is the shift towards risk relationships that are much more longitudinal in nature. What do you mean by that? Meaning, uh, yeah, so right now in the U.S., very broadly, but really also many other countries still, most healthcare services get reimbursed based on just the activity itself. Yeah. Uh, you do the service and you get a flat fee for it. They don't really get um, paid for based on outcomes. Okay. Um, and so it sort of it, it sets up this odd situation where you know I meet plenty of companies who have an incredible AI algorithm to uh, you know automate uh, radiology for example uh, diagnostics and in, at least in the US there really isn't any market for that mm. because um, you can sell into a hospital but a hospital doesn't really have any incentive to try to take cost out from from the process because again they're getting paid for the service of it not for the outcome of it you know. Um, there isn't a lot of cost pressure or value pressure on the value chain and delivering value for, for, for money, basically. Um, 
And so that last element of really shifting everybody who provides a service or a device into the healthcare system, in the delivery system, uh, to shift those folks towards risk for outcomes, yeah. I think is a really critical way of bending down the cost curve in all industrialized countries um, in their healthcare systems. And so that is where we have seen, that's sort of a big reason why um, we didn't build Oscar j just, so to speak, as a insurance company from early on, but we also said we got to build our own infrastructure Mm -hmm. um, and we got to build even the sort of like parts of the infrastructure others might consider commoditized. You know, they're, they're, the claim system in insurance companies is this classic example where most claim systems are from the 70s, 80s, whatever. Insurers sit on many different ones because they bought a bunch of insurers over the years and they never kind of unified the architecture and all these things. And it, 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 it really slows down innovation because it doesn't let you configure you know, clever benefit designs and incentive designs and so on. It's not like, you know, where you could run a thousand AP tests in parallel. That just doesn't work in healthcare. Um, and the reason is these infrastructure issues oftentimes. And so uh, the other part of Oscar's business model actually is to go and take our infrastructure and enable those who find themselves in this pathway towards risk and give them our infrastructure and rent, rent that out to them basically, yeah? That could be um, digital health companies uh, who want to start a pay getting a bigger part of the pie, basically, and take that risk. It could be provider systems who want to become insurance companies. It could be um, existing insurance companies who want to become a better technology player. And I think those are the three big trends, individualization, digitization, and, and, and risk sharing um, that are going to dominate this. And in the extreme case, I think what it will mean 10 years from now or so is – I really doubt you're going to have the distinction between providers and insurance companies in 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. The pure play insurers, I think, will be mostly gone. Um, they'll either have provider services or the providers will have insurance services. Healthcare might very well be like that in 10 years from now, where you have a clever algorithm, you deploy it, um, others implement it, mm -hmm. uh, take the risk on it, and you sort of like get the get the, the, the rent, basically the, the, the income based on that, you know? Mario, if you step back to just what you're talking about, the business model, where you could have just pursued individualization and digitization, the risk sharing and, and attacking the infrastructure might not have been in, intuitive to some. As, a, as an entrepreneur, what advice do you give to other entrepreneurs doing this the first time? You've learned a lot from what you said before, and you called it avoidable mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's your advice? What's your advice about avoidable mistakes and taking risk? Yeah. I mean, honestly, the first thing I'd say about avoidable mistakes is that you probably have to make many of them yourself. <laughs> you know? yep. it's, um, I mean, I, 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 most of the startups I tried, I didn't even remotely count in my quick recounting of the stuff I've done. I mean, there are many other attempts and ideas I had over the years, which all ended in ignominy, you know, um, and so, uh, nobody ever heard about it. And so you have to, it's, it's about the sort of like, uh, in American sports analogy would be probably at bats or something like that. You know, like you just got to yeah. show up a couple of times and try um, and make these mistakes yourself. The second thing I'd say is, big learning for me really is that a lot of startup success actually ends up being driven, I think, by people matters um, rather than by necessarily strategy or even execution um, or even luck, um, at least those are the things that can most easily bring you down, uh, the, the people matters. You know, are you really in tune with your co-founders? Um, is your management team really all in? You know, is, um, are you communicating right uh, in the right way? Um, do you have the right people in the company? Um, that is what, what fails a lot of first-time entrepreneurs, in, in, my, in my view. Um, there's almost no startup I know of that's successful today that hasn't had big falling outs with investors or co-founders or um, early employees or something of that nature at various times in their history as a company. And I don't think that's necessarily what you think of when you're a first-time entrepreneur. I think the other thing is, um, uh, this is nothing new, uh, it can be brutal in some sense and, and the, mm. the amount of luck that's involved. Mm. It's not like getting a promotion or whatever in a company that has established processes. There, there isn't oftentimes fair compensation for your efforts you know uh, the journey is part of the is part of the part yeah. of the end goal there that's really it's a truism but it's really true so when you look at that journey what would you say has been the redefining most important redefining moment for you to help you become the leader that you are today 
there's a German competition called Jugendforscht, um, which is sort of like a technical competition um, that high school students in Germany can participate in. And so I, for a long time, even though I liked coding and I got into it pretty early, I never thought I'm all that good at it. And I never thought I would go and study it at university and actually started studying linguistics and political science in my first half a year at university. And then I changed to electric engineering. So <laughs> it didn't last that long, but it wasn't my first choice there. And so I had a, a um, physics teacher who said, you should participate in this, in this competition. And so um, the thing I did was, this, I think, combination of creativity and data. And I built a little device that was able to take a camera on the computer and film your eye and that you kind of control your computer with your eye movements. This is 1995, so pretty early on in terms yeah. of how computer vision work and all that stuff. And, and it was such a um, fun project that was, I think the design of it was more fun than even the engineering of it. And, and so, um, the fact that someone counseled me to go in there was, was a lot of fun. And it makes me think that um, these nudges at the right point in your life are super important and they're also very random and you can't always uh, predict when they will happen. Um, and so one of the things I told myself back then is to really, anytime somebody tells you to go do something and try and maybe try, I always try to go and do it, you know, <laughs> and so, uh, um, you never know, you know, because you never know exactly. Right. And, and so, um, obviously exposing more people to potentially that kind of feedback and giving them more early on mentoring and coaching of that sort is super important as well. Um, I was lucky to have this one person at my high school to know this competition or whatever else. Many people grow up not having that. And so that's the you know, important thing. Mario, we'd like to end each podcast with a set of rapid fire questions. So this is where we're going to ask you five seemingly random questions and we ask you to reply as quickly as possible with the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. Okay. So uh, what's your hidden talent, Mario? Oh my God. I was going to say I love making games, but that's not that hidden anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I've been learning how to, to, to reach uh, Mandarin. So maybe that's a hidden talent. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hidden talent. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, knowing what you know today, what advice would you give your 18-year-old self? Uh, to write down everything you do. When you start doing it, stop doing it. I do that today and put a grade behind how you feel because it's great data to have looking back and figuring out what really gets you going and motivates you. Speaking of motivation, what was your worst subject in school? Chemistry. Yeah, for some reason. And it was also teacher related. I never liked the teachers I had there. I hope they're not listening. <laughs> um, but if, I found it very boring and uh, uninteresting. So that was my worst subject. <laughs> Mario, when was the last time you were wrong? Actually, yeah, we were playing a board game with my wife and my kids yesterday. Uh, a German board game from 1982 called Saga Lands, which is highly recommended. I think it's called the Enchanted Forest in, in the US. You have to like guess a bunch of trees, or whatever, you know, and I, <laughs> I guessed that tree incorrectly, which is very, uh, in, in, which is very indicative also of, um, uh, I think of, um, on some level, how you got to act in the startup life, you know, it's, it feels too simple to say it's, it's all a game. It isn't right. There's obviously a lot of people's fates and everything at stake. Um, but if you don't have some sort of like playful, way of dealing with the challenges and the, you know, stuff that gets thrown at you, uh, it just gets much harder. And so I think uh, German board games are one way of teaching yourself that. <laughs> Fantastic. Plus your wife got to win. So uh, it's even better for the family. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> well, Mario, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And, and a lot of things learned about avoidable mistakes, about technology, making healthcare more human, uh, about making smart choices about people and, Startups maybe aren't all about the strategy and the execution, but kind of the, the chemistry, the blow-ups, and making it through to the next phase. So a lot of learnings for us here today, a lot of data for us to learn from about leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on the program. It's really fun. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Redefiners. For more dynamic insights from leaders from across industries and around the world, listen to Redefiners wherever you get your podcasts. And to learn more or get in contact with us, visit our website at russellreynolds.com, find us on LinkedIn, and follow us on Twitter at RA on Leadership. See you next time. <laughs>